All right, I'm going to present myself first. My name is Jesus Mayoral, and I have been born and raised in this lagoon. So I grew up uh, alongside the whales and all the lagoon nature. So I'm going to go through my life a little bit, but we're going to start where I come from. So my family is the original family from here, from San Ignacio Lagoon, with roots from way back in the 1800s. So I'm going to shuffle a little bit of what happened back in the 1800s, and we're going to start with whale hunting, which what happened with the whale hunting here in Baja started back in the 1845, 1846, and it started down in Magdalena Bay. So there was uh, somebody discovered that there was a bunch of whales, and it was a lot easier to hunt whales down there than what, where they were doing out in the ocean. So this, these people, they hunted for a few years before everybody heard about it up in California and all over the world. So by 1847, 48, there was a bunch of other boats that came looking for the place where the, all the whales were congregated and there were an easy hunt. So this went on for a bunch of years down in Magdalena Bay. And you know, the most famous whaler out there, it's been Captain Scammons. But he didn't show up until 10 years later after all this whaling had been done over here. So Captain Scammons also found Magdalena Bay with these guys and they were hunting over there and eventually they figured out that the, the whale numbers were starting to go down. And Scammons said, well, I'm gonna go start venturing up north. So he came along the coast and he found San Ignacio Lagoon. So he, he came in here, he hunted a little bit and then uh, he came here for a few years in a row and then other whalers also found San Ignacio Lagoon and they kept on sc scouting up north and then they found what now is Scammons Lagoon which was one of the main hunting lagoons in Baja and that's because Scammons Lagoon is a bigger lagoon. Okay, we're not going to call it Scammons right now. This is Ojo de Liebre which is, means the eye of the jackrabbit and that's how Mexicans call it. So because all of the hunting was done over in that area and because Scammons kept a log on everything they were doing. He was measuring whales, weighting them. He, because of him, we know a lot of information from, from back in those days because he kept a log on everything. So when they decided that Scammons Lagoon was the main hunting place, very few boats kept coming to San Ignacio Lagoon. And well, when they were coming in, into this area around 1870s, 1860s, they, they were around, uh, they decided to make a base for the whalers here in, in San Ignacio Lagoon. So you guys that have been whale watching, going every day, back and forth, you saw that there is one place, like the next camp over, that has some orange paint on it, on their cabins and their buildings over there. So that's exactly where the whalers decided to do their base and it's called La Freidera, which means the fryer. So what they were doing over there, they were frying all the blubber and getting just the oil and putting it in barrels, wooden barrels. And that's where my, com my family comes along. So my great grandfather arrived in this area back in the 1860s when they were over there. So since he was a carpenter, first thing he did was just find a job over there as a carpenter and he was fixing the barrels. Um, in the summer, he was a fisherman. So he, he had his family here in San Ignacio Lagoon and he had 11 kids. So from all of those 11 kids, that there was like half uh, fishermen, half ranchers. So that doesn't mean that half of the family always stayed in the beach or in the ranch. They were swapping back and forth. So the, the whole family experienced both things. So the family on the beach, what they were doing, they were, you know, catching mainly turtles, black sea bass and sharks. Only big stuff. If they if they caught like a group of about this big, back in the water. It's not good. Too little. So what they were doing, yeah, they they had big enough pieces that they were not gonna waste their time on a little piece. So exactly. So what they were doing back here in the coast, they were you know we're sur surrounded by salt flats. There's a lot of salt to collect. They were collecting salt, um, grinding it, and salting all the fish and all the meat they had drying it and then packing it up. So they had packs and packs and packs. And eventually, like once a month, the family that was here in the lagoon, they would just grab all of the, those goodies, going to town and exchanging for other supplies that they didn't have down here. Which town? San Ignacio, which is the, the nearest town. So that's town for us. Um, all the other towns we had no connection with. So 
Uh, same thing happened with the people in the ranches. So the family was back and forth. They brought goodies from the ranch to the beach and vice versa. So other families that were up in the hills, that there's a bunch of ranches up there, they, they were growing veggies, they were growing fruit and like meat and stuff, and they would come down to the beach and exchange it. So pretty much the whole life down here, it was uh, used to trade. So uh, from those 11 kids that they were fishing by rowing, they were going out of the lagoon, just rowing in wooden boats. So you can imagine that they were strong people. Uh, so they didn't leave us any of that for us. Uh, <laughs> When, when they were uh, discovering other places along the coast, like north from here, Punta Riojos, uh, La Bocana, Bahia Tortugas, Bahia Asuncion, a bunch of towns north of here, San Juanico down south, uh, they were going and spending months in those places for fishing, and then they would come back to the lagoon all the time. So from all of these kids, of my grandfather's kids, they started just settling in different places along the coast. And that's, uh, well, other people started going to those fishing villages, and that's how those towns started forming. So uh, from all of those kids, only three of them stayed in the lagoon. My grandfather and two of his brothers. The two brothers never got married, they never had families, and they passed away here in the lagoon. My, my grandfather had 11 kids, I mean, nine kids. And from those nine kids, my mom was there. Uh, also, uh, I don't know if any of you guys have been out there with Chavalo. Anybody been out there with Chavalo? Well, Chavalo's mom and my mom are sisters. And they, the two of them were part of the three kids that stay here. The other kid that stayed, that was the cousin. The cousin of them that moved with my grandfather when he was about seven years old. And my grandfather taught him how to fish and everything. So some, somebody out there had Tico today as a, as a captain. So Tico's grandfather was my mom's cousin who, was, who grew up with them. So. When I was little, there was just those three families in the lagoon. There was a couple uncles that never got married and they were kind of in and out of the lagoon. They had a ranch and they would come for periods of time to the lagoon and go back. So uh, my dad, he comes from a different place. My dad was born in Mulehe. On a very young age, he, he was very adventurous. And I'm going to tell you this first adventure he got himself on. And he was 11 years old and the family moved from Mulehe to Santa Rosalia, which is, uh, it, back in the days, it was a French mining town. So the, the way Santa Rosalia was working, like they had like a, a couple of big boats that would come into port, bring all the goodies for town, and live with, uh, with all the copper that they were taking in somewhere else. So my dad was supposed to go to school, 11 years old, and then he decided, I'm going to port. So he went to the port, he got in one of those boats, and he, he was just playing on the boat while the boat was in port. But he never realized that, that that was the day of departure. So when, the, the, when he realized, they were way off sea already, and there was no turnaround. So the family, my grandfather, he searched the entire town of Santa Rosalia with militaries, with cops, with everyone in town. And of course, nobody found him. For about three months, this went on until they gave up. They decided that, well, just not talk about it because they didn't know what was going on. So uh, six months later, the boat comes back to port. And my dad shows up at my grandparents' house in a taxi cab with a couple <laughs> bags of fruit. You know, he's walked in and everybody's so surprised but happy that he was back. So my grandfather forced him to finish elementary school. And then he went into secondary school, which is the next one up. and. Then he did it again. He did it again. He was 14 when he decided to get on a shrimper's boat and he went over to mainland Mexico, Guaymas. And uh, well, by then, my dad's oldest sister was married to a guy who was working on a shrimp boat. So my grandfather, when he figured out where he was, he said, well, okay, you want to be in the boats, you're going to be in the boats, but with your brother-in-law. That's the only way. So he did it for a few years and then he decided to come back to Baja. Then he went back to Mulehe where he was born. And he was working at a hotel over there, which uh, is still the, the only hotel in Mulahe that has a landing strip. And it's called Hotel Serenidad. So there was planes landing there all the time, in and out. And eventually, they figured out that they could come to San Ignacio Lagoon and hunt on brand geese. 
Are you guys familiar with brand geese? So the brands are, it's a type of geese that migrates down to Baja every winter from cold waters of Alaska and Canada. So what they were doing, they had a, an aluminum boat here in the lagoon, hidden in the mangroves. And the plane would land on the salt flats every time. They would go find the boat and go out hunting. And my dad was the captain of the boat. So he, they would bring like three, four hunters at a, at a time. And then they would go back with all the catch. I have no idea what they did with it, but they brought it back to Mulehe. So this went on for a couple of years. And eventually my dad was like, okay, I had vacations now. I'm going to San Ignacio Lagoon. So he came here to spend his vacations and he never left. So he married my mom. And then he became part of the fishing village, like with my mom's brothers. Uh, and then uh, random 1968 day, just uh, somebody from South Dakota. He showed up at the lagoon and he's talking to the fishermen and he sees the, the spouts out there. And so he asks, what is that? They say, well, those, those are whales. And uh, can anybody take me? He's, Everybody just look at each other and they're like, uh, the crazy one here is Pachico. So <laughs> he might take you. So, yeah, my dad took him out. He took a very good distance from the whales. They could see the whales and stuff, but they were still afraid of the whales. In fact, when they were going out fishing, by this time, they were not rowing anymore. They had little engines. Uh, and when they started going out fishing like that, they would have a piece of wood and they would be constantly banging on the boats, boom, 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 just to scare the whales away. That's why when we're whale watching out there and there's somebody like drops a bottle or goes like this on the boat, that's no good for the whales. The whales get scared with loud, loud noises like that. So uh, when we knock on the boat for those things, we just go very gentle and in different parts of the boats trying to imitate their vocalization, which I'm completely sure we're very far off. <laughs> but that's the closest we can get. So anyways, any questions about this? All right. So after my dad took this random person out there, that was pretty much it for that time. The same person came back the following year and my dad took him out again. He was with another friend. They went out there, took some pictures and stuff. They left again. That was it. Uh, eventually, well, after this experience, my dad started thinking, oh, that it might be a good idea, but he didn't really, was not trusting the whales that much yet. So, another random day, 1972, he was out there fishing. Uh, have you guys gone to that place where we go for a break sometimes and he's back in the estuary? So right at the entrance of that estuary, there's a rock over there that is really good for fishing. And my dad was fishing in that exact place. It's very shallow with uh, his best friend and all of a sudden they see something under the boat so they were hand lining and right away they pick up their lines they don't want to hook this whale because all they knew about the whales is that the whales could kill people and that came from back in the in the hunting days because difference from other whales the gray whales i'm very proud of them they fight for their lives uh most of the other whales when they were being hunted they would get harpooned and they would try to get away so they're going, trying to get away, but the harpoon is tied to their, to their boat. So the whale would be towing their boat until it got tired and died and would go down, and then the big boat would come and pick it up. So the gray whales, no. Gray whales feel that they are hurt. They turn around and they fight for their lives. So they would hit boats, flip them over, kill people, and that's why they gained their name as devil fish. And that's kind of what everybody knew about the encounters from whales and people. So when this happened, that the whale was underneath their boat and they're petrified, they don't know what to do. So when my dad told me this story, I had to ask the question, what did you think? And he said, well, if she was going to kill me, might as well, I'm going to touch it. And he did. So the whale was kind of spy hopping in one side of the boat, then the other, and eventually doing a little scratches on the boat. And he just went like this. And then a little bit more and more until he was just robbing it. Robbing it and the whale was loving it. Why? We don't know. But my dad and I, we both agree on the same thing. We think that the whales are trying to teach us a lesson. A lesson of humanity and forgiveness. Humanity seems to be gone in the humankind now. We're just fighting each other for no reason. Sorry for my French, but that's what's really going on in this world. In the other hand, Forgiveness, we have done so much harm to the species and they, yet they still come 
to touch us. And they are not only touch us physically, they touch us physically and in our hearts, in our souls. So that's why we believe they're trying to teach us that lesson that we need. Uh, I have a theory on what the whales think, which it might be very far, but you know, sometimes we think like, well, okay, we splash water and stuff and there, we're gonna turn the whales friendly. Well, no, that does not happen. If it is a friendly whale, it might get attracted by it, but we do not turn the whales friendly. The ones that are friendly, they want to be friendly for, I don't know why. But there is, uh, there's a lot, most of the whales don't even care that we're there. They keep on doing their same normal life, whether we're splashing or singing or dancing or whatever. So it's about a 10% of the whales that we see here here in the lagoon that would show a friendly behavior at some point, not necessarily all the time. They're also moody, just like us. Sometimes you're in the mood to play with a friend, sometimes you don't even open the door. Pretend not to be home. So it's kind of the same thing. That's the whale's house out there. The intruders are us. They've been there for centuries. We've been here just for a few years. Yes. Are the whales here all the time? N no. The whales are here only during the winter, and only the ones that, are, that have business in the lagoon are the ones that come inside. So business here means reproduction. So if the whale is not reproducing, they have no business here in the lagoon. That's why we might have 20,000 whales in this population right now, and if we count Scammon's Lagoon, San Ignacio Lagoon, three places in Magdalena Bay, we're not even close. Why? Because only the ones that have business come inside. So the rest of them, they do migrate, but they don't need to come inside the lagoon. So with photo identification these days, we have found out that sometimes the, we might have had 300 whales at the same time in the lagoon, 250. So in fact, the number, the last number we've had from this year was 196 or 95, something like that, singles and 10 mother and baby pairs. And that was, those were the numbers from two days ago. So. From all of those whales, well, you guys seen it. We see a lot of them just doing their own business over there, and they don't pay attention on us because they have more important things to do. But there's some out there that would like to come and touch us. So my theory when it comes to touching, because some, you know, sometimes we're all splashing and so excited, and the whale comes under the boat and touches the boat a little bit, and we're like, oh, no, no, we, never, we didn't touch the whale. Well, you did. Because what I feel is that these whales... They don't know that it's a boat full of people. So my theory is that they might think it's just one thing. It's one animal that is big. It has a lot of uh, arms and a lot of heads. <laughs> and some of them louder than others. So <laughs> I feel like when they're coming underneath and they touch the boat, they already touched us. They're making contact with us uh, because of what they see. In my experience, we have put divers in the water that have a special permit to dive with the whales. Well, we have seen it every single time the whales try to hit him, boom, with their tail. So now, even if you have a special permit, I'm not going to put you in the water. You're not going to get killed in my watch. So when, when we have people with special permits like that, we just encourage them, you know, there is GoPros. Just put them on a stick and put it down. But we're not going to let anybody in the water near the whales. Two things. Main thing, the whales, if it's a mother with a baby, well, they, they have to be very protective. Like if any of you is walking with a kid and something weird approaches, you're not going to like it. You're going to try to get it out of the way. That's exactly what they do when they see a diver. We are weird creatures in the water. They don't know us in the water. They know us in the boats. That's what they might think that we are part of the boat. But when we have had a person near a whale, well, they're like, you're no good to me. They start thrashing their tail around and it gets very dangerous. So we had two very clear uh, experiences before we figured this out. And one was with Christopher Reeves. Uh, we were doing a documentary out there. We put him in the water. There he's in the film. He's in the water. There's whales and stuff. But that whale almost killed him. Missed him by this much on his head. So that's when my dad said, okay, out of the water, back on the boat, you're not going back in the water. And then we had another person, a millionaire, that came here uh, one year on his private jet. 
and he goes out well watching. Well, next year, oh, I want to film my son right there with mating whales. <laughs> so he came the following year with his permit, and he had his son out there, and they're filming, and one of the whales, well, when they're mating, they see a weird thing. They associate that with, uh, with competition. So same thing, boom, all missed him by a little bit, and the guy canceled everything. And that was the last time we put a diver in the water. So uh, a few of my friends that are underwater videographers, they have come here to shoot with the whales, and they ask me, like, what do you think? I'm like, you're not going down there. So Alfredo, you know Alfredo. He's been down there working with me over here, and he listens to me, finally. <laughs> so questions? Yes? Why do they spy hop? <laughs> nice one. So, scientifically, nobody knows why they spy, they spy hop. The term spy hopping makes us think that they might be looking around, but big percentage of the time when they do it, their eye doesn't even come out of the water. So that denies the point that that's what they're doing all the time. So it might be the case in some, sometimes. But their eyes are opposite than ours. Their eyes are designed for water. So the way we go underwater, we open our eyes, we can't see that clear. It's the opposite for them. If they are near the boat right there, they, they will see you. But air is going to dry their eyes, and they're not going to see that clear. In the other hand, there's some other of the theories of spy happiness that they might be standing on their tail uh, with their tail in the bottom. But we, we've seen them doing it in places that are too deep for them to reach. So same again. It can be the case, but not necessarily. Uh, also... Uh, I've heard people saying, oh, there's bubbles, there's going to be a spy hop. Well, here 50 and 50. It might happen, it might not. <laughs> so the only thing that seems to make sense to me when it comes to spy hopping is that currents play a big role in it. Because if there's no current, they're not spy hopping. So once the current starts ripping strong, they start spy hopping. And they start doing it in a few different places that seems like they do it more than others. Why? Because the bottom is, is in a way that helps them to do it. And because the current ripping strong, so let's say right in the center over there when we arrive to the observation area, you know, the area where everybody congregates around there, that I call it, that's downtown observation area. It seems like the party is there all the time. So what happens there, we have a big rocky bottom in the center and we have two channels that run along the sides. And that is the deepest part of the lagoon in both sides where, where the current hits the rock and creates like steers around. There's a hole in each side that reaches about 90 feet. So when it, this current ri rips and hits the strong, the, the rock, it creates an upwelling. And it seems like when the whales are you swimming, because they're always swimming against the current, that mainly... Uh, they could always go a different direction, but then they're going to turn into the current. If the current is going out of the lagoon, they're going to be facing this way. If the current is going out, they're going to be facing the other way. So why do they swim against the current? Because they just want to be in the position. They are not trying to get anywhere. So they need to be inside of the lagoon, and the only way they can make sure that they will be inside of the lagoon is by always swimming against the current which also that current plays a big role with babies. Babies are in a treadmill here. Um, so, and we'll get back to that. Any questions about this? Yes. I have a question. Is there research that shows, like they go up and they feed and they get so large and then their whole journey down, they ex expend energy and then have a baby and then they're milking and then they go, to, go all the way up. I mean, they don't eat for how many months and like how much, how much body mass do they, do they have? Well, they're losing a lot. So, yeah, you're right. Nine they're, months, yeah. It's, it's about nine months. So the way the population moves, and this is a rough estimate of the population migration. It's not individually. Because individually, we haven't tracked them uh, good enough to, to know those facts. But let's say the whole population would spend up north about three months feeding and then they, the whole population would start moving slowly south because they migrate with water temperature. So let's say there's a, a line up north, you know, the, there's summers up there and uh, the whales are feeding up north and there's a line of 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And when, when the Arctic starts freezing, that line starts moving south. 
that's when they know that it's time to start migrating. So they start following that line, they come with it. And in years of El Nino, that line comes and passes San Ignacio Lagoon, sometimes barely makes it to, San, to Magdalena Bay, sometimes it's north of Magdalena Bay, and sometimes barely south of it. In those years, it's hard for Magdalena Bay to get enough whales. They don't get many over there in those years. But on the other hand, in La Nina years, that line of, of temperature passes Cabo. And in those years, we get to see gray whales in the Sea of Cortez. So when they migrate like that, well, they're known for being opportunistic. If they, if they find a little bit of food here and there, they will take advantage of it. And we see it here in the lagoon. We see them scratching the bottom a lot. So we see a lot of singles doing it. We see mothers teaching their babies doing it. So there is little bits here in the lagoons that they can snack on, but those, that doesn't mean that it can sustain them. So it's technically we're eat, eating peanuts for until we get somewhere. So here is where the mothers are going to teach the babies where the food's in the bottom. Even though they're not getting much, but it's very important for the mothers to know that the babies have down, that down to perfection. Why? Because by the time they go back and reach feeding grounds, mom's not going to want to feed the baby. She's like, I'm, she's starving already. So she says, baby, your food's down there, go get it. So technically, the baby would stay with the mom six to eight months, average. And then they would separate because of feeding, but they could be nearby, but not necessarily together anymore. Questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, ideally, the ones that make it into the lagoon, they give birth farther into the lagoon, and that's why we don't have access to the north end of the lagoon. Okay. So uh, the place they're looking for, it's a shallow place. Shallow. They tend to go kind of in the sides of the lagoon into shallow waters, and they bring their tail down, anchor themselves in a place that they can still reach the surface. Why? Because after giving birth to a 15-foot baby that weighs a half a ton, they are tired <laughs> and all the mom wants to do is just brings the baby up to the surface with a pectoral fin and to, for the baby to find air and then she lets it go and the baby starts figuring out how to swim. When the baby is newborn their tail looks like this. It's bent in the sides so they don't know how to swim. Their tail is not perfect to swim yet so it takes them a whole day out there to extend their tail and it would it would show flapping out of the water and very uncoordinated so uh, not a lot of people have been able to see newborns I was lucky enough that I found one one time in the observation area which means that that whale made it here late and that case has been happening a lot we have had register of whales uh, birds all the way from Southern California down here. So a lot of those whales that are born out of the lagoons because they don't make it on time, they are in a lot of danger. Some of them make it, some, a lot of them don't. Yes? Did your dad start the ecotourism business here? How well, did that begin? My dad started, well, you know, I'm going to go through something a little bit before that, which is how everybody got here first which is, uh, well, after my dad touched the whale and he went back to tell the family and everybody, everybody thought he was crazy. So he stopped talking about it uh, because nobody was going to believe it. He said, okay, I'm, may, I might be crazy, but I know what I did. I'm just going to stop talking about it. So in 1976, Steve Schwartz showed up. He came here to the lagoon for the first time to do his thesis, and he had a team of of researchers with him. So what they were doing, uh, well, Steve was trying to do his thesis with the whales. They were doing, um, taking samples of everything that they could back in those days. They had a small inflatable and an engine that was sponsored then to do their studies. And when my dad told Steve the story, Steve said, oh yeah, that's possible. So, and soon enough, other boats started coming from San Diego to whale watch. Here. So most of these boats are, is anybody from, from San Diego over here? 
in Point Loma, there's a fleet over there that is called Fisherman's Landing. So the boats for Fisherman's Landing were coming here with tourists to see the whales. So back in those days, they were just putting their own dinghies in the water and go whale watching in their own, no permits, and there was nothing. So 1978, my dad decided, well, I'm going to request the permit to the Mexican government. So he did. And the, the Mexican government said, what are you trying to do? We have no clue what you're trying to do, so we cannot give you an authorization for this. So my dad wrote everything down. He wrote what was he going to do, where he was going to do it, and how he was going to do it. So technically, he just went to the offices and said, sign it. So they signed it for him. And, uh, well, it's in record in the country that the, the very first permit for whale watching in the country was my dad's. So a few years ago, he met with somebody from Scammons Lagoon who, who asked him, Okay, but you could tell me how do you do it and stuff. So they they talked about it, and then Enrique Achoy did it up in Scamas Lagoon and Don Modesto Camacho in Magdalena Bay. So they were the first, the three first main whale watchers. And then, well, Timo, he was one of the persons that was just bringing people to all of the places. Timo was the original founder of Baja Expeditions, and uh, he was very good friends with my dad. So, for a while, my dad had the boat business with, uh, with, in partnership with one of the guys that was here with Steve. So, one of the guys of Steve's team, he decided eventually, well, I'm going to set up a camp and I'm going to bring tourists from up north. So, he started going up north and coming back and driving with some people. And he had an inflatable, too. And he was whale watching on his inflatable and he was hiring my dad with his wooden boat. So, that's kind of how they started. So this went on for a while. This guy eventually he got married with a with a okay his name was Pete and her name was Karen. So together they formed one of the companies which the one that is out there in the point which is the oldest camp in the lagoon that's why they have their prime spot. So they were partnering up with my dad eventually uh, Pete and Karen split she kept the camp still the partner up with my dad and uh, a few years later, they split. And then some other companies started forming along the lagoon at the same time. So after there was a few companies, the Biosphere Reserve also was the, uh, started in 1988. So when the Biosphere Reserve noticed that there was more companies forming here in the lagoon, Okay, there wasn't the need for regulations. And the first Biosphere Reserve officials that were in the area, they were always coming to my dad and, and to get information. Okay, tell me about this, tell me about that. So a lot of those rules, my dad helped the Biosphere Reserve officials on, to write them, to figure them out, uh, to do something that makes sense. So eventually, when all of these other companies were formed here in the lagoon, uh, we create an association. And that's the reason why you guys see a guard in the area over there. That, that guard is an employee of us, of the association. Because uh, we designed the most advanced set of rules for whale watching with gray whales. Uh, the, we work with three set of rules here. So the main one comes from Mexico City, from people that don't know anything about whales. <laughs> and so it's very general and talks about whales in general. So we a lot of the things that are stated in that uh, law don't make any sense here because they're written like looking at humpback whales, looking at all kinds of different whales. And there's the Biosphere Reserve laws, which is the man Biosphere Reserve Management Plan, and that's uh, one of the, the strongest rules that we follow here. But on top of that, we make our, our own rules in the association here. And those are the ones, the only ones that are designed specifically for gray whales. So we designed those rules specifically for gray whales, specifically for San Ignacio Lagoon. And that's why we have the guard over there and we have to check times with him. Um, and if we go over our time, he's going to kick us out of the area. And it's totally fine because we have 26 boats permitted here in the lagoon. And from all of those boats, only 16 have access at the same time in the area. So that's why 90 minutes periods are have to be respected over there. So we go out of the area, other boats go in, and we just change. And that's why also it's very important to be on time 
on every outing out there because if we are on, already on a schedule and we have people not ready when we need them, well, that time is going to get shortened up from our uh, whale watching time. Questions? Yes. You had mentioned something about the current and you were going to get back to the calves and the current. Yes. Well, that's when they are about to migrate north. When the migration north happens, well, this is the, the whale's house over here. They, they're, they're mating here, they're born here, which makes them Mexicans. So when, <laughs> after mating, mating is going to go on strong until mid-March. By mid-March, well, some of, the, some of the single females out there, they're already pregnant and they're getting ready. They go to the shallows, they feed a little bit on whatever they can find, which is mostly amphipods and crustaceans. And then they're going to start heading north on their own. Whoever's ready to go is going to go. Not necessarily they're going to get in a pod and go. So when, uh, when they go, all of the singles go, only, only mothers and babies are here in the lagoon. And then the mothers and babies that are coming from, from the south, from Magdalena Bay, they would come here into San Ignacio Lagoon and they would start socializing with the, with the whales that are here. And at the same time, they're going to take more training here. So the two parts of the training that they have to do here is like scratching the bottom. So the baby has to be good at that. But also the baby is always swimming against the current because he needs to be strong enough to put up with 6,000 mile migration they have ahead of him. So that's the other part. When the baby has two down, uh, very, very well um, dominated, let's say, that's when that baby is ready to go. And the mother says, okay, we are ready, they go. They're not going to wait for other my mothers to get their babies ready. So it, they are kind of in their own migrating that way. So when they're migrating up north, half of them might not make it. There's orcas in the way. And very important, there's no killer whales in this world. A lot of us are used to say, oh, killer whales. Well, they don't exist. There's nothing in this world, that, in nature, that are killers. Everybody plays a very important role, and it's called uh, ecological equilibrium. S some eat others, and that's just how the chain goes. And that doesn't make anybody guilty. Because it, I know it seems very dra dramatic when a, an orca grabs a sea lion and he's just breaking it all apart to eat it. Well, they don't have hands. What do you expect? <laughs> and in the other hand, the sea lions do exact same thing to the halibut and all the fish they get, octopi and everything. So that's why we should not call them killer whales. And that's one of my missions to make sure that everybody that comes around me knows this. Why? Because we're the biggest killers in the world. We have no right to call them that. Any more questions? Yes. Not necessarily. Uh, with the photo ID, we have seen that uh, if we have 300 whales here in the lagoon, at the end of the season, when the scientists are comparing all the pictures, they figure out that 700 of them came in here. So it's what we think is that a lot of these whales just visited a lot of the lagoons, whether they're sexually mature or not. In fact, at the beginning of the season, we saw some individuals here in the lagoon that we haven't seen them again. So that means that they maybe kept on going south and went to another of the lagoons, some other lagoons down there. Yes. So this um, behavior, is it a uh, something that only happens in these lagoons, Magdalene, uh, or is it some place other, you know, is this the only place in the world? Which behavior? The, the touching, coming out. Uh, it happens in all of the Baja lagoons. It seems like once they're inside of a closed body of water like that, they, they behave very differently. Uh, I don't know if they feel like the, the, there's no predators, they can trust a little bit more. Um, it could be that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there was a question out there. Okay. Just how do you do the count each year? Okay. The, the whale count got this, uh, well, Steve and his team, Steve Swartz and his team, they were the ones that figured out how to count whales by boat. 
And the way they do it, you need a four people team. So you have somebody looking to one side with a range about 90 degrees and the other person on the other side. So those are the viewers and they have binoculars and you see how the lagoon is very narrow. You can see both sides and they have a GPS route through the main channels of the lagoon that they follow at certain speed and they pretty much count everything that's there. Back in the 70s, uh, beginning of the 80s, all of the counts used to be done by planes. So because of the lagoon being so shallow, from a plane you can count them all easy. But the planes are also disturbing and very expensive. So when, they, when Steve started doing his counts by boat, they started comparing his counts with the counts that they were done by, by plane. And then they were offered just very few individuals. So they decided to get rid of the planes, keep on doing it by boats. So and nowadays they've been doing it like since the 70s. What? Yes? Uh, the numbers are up and down, up and down. And this, I'm going to go back to the end of the 90s, which was when we reached the highest numbers on the population. Our population over here, which is the Eastern Pacific population, had reached up to 30,000 individuals. And in a matter of three, four years, we lost a third of the entire population. They, the weather, whales started seeing skinny and skinnier and skinnier until we had a huge mortality. Here in San Ignacio Lagoon, four to six whales is still under normal, normal numbers. Uh, they have to die somewhere. And if they spend that period of time here, it's very natural that, they, that we will see some, some dead here. So anyways, uh, what happened in, the, in those years is that there was not enough food for such a big population. And so that's why they started seeing skinnier and skinnier until a lot of them were starving and dying. So in, that, in those years, we had one year specifically that we had like 47 dead whales here in the lagoon. We were freaking out, as you can imagine. And we were asking all the scientists, like, what's going on? Should we be scared of what was going on? They said, oh, no, they're going to figure it out. Because whales have been one of the species that are, uh, have a, the best capacity of adaptation. So... And, and yes, it happened when they were taking samples on a lot of these whales that were surviving a few years later. You know, they were taking like uh, dissections from skin and, and blubber and they would put them into the lab and figure out pretty much what they were feeding on. And they found that they were also feeding in small sardine back then, which was a, a move they did to not lose the population. So in those years, when the population drops like that, they tend to have more babies for a few years, kind of to come back. But if all of them reproduce, then they would run out of food in a couple of years again because there are so many of them out there. So right now, well, that, that, in those years, the population recoup and it went up to 26,000 again. And then another mortality starting to happen. And we're just coming out of it right now. In fact, uh, you guys know, I, I pointed out a couple of skinny whales out there today. And so we've seen some skinny whales still out there, but a lot of them are looking nice and chunky these days. Questions? Yes. Are you going to write a book? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe if you help me, I'll do it. <laughs> I, I started one years ago, but I lost everything in the computer where I had it. Uh, and it was a little bit m more of, a, of what to expect when you haven't come to San Ignacio Lagoon and whale watch here. Because I know a lot of people come here with different ideas. And most of them have no clue on how really it is. So when you come here in repetitive times, you know already what's going on. But from the first time, I would re be very happy if everybody that comes to the lagoon read this before and say, oh, this is what really is going on right there. Yes. Well, you've grown up with the whales your whole life. So yeah. It's like instinctual. But the scientists come in, are they collaborative? Do they work with you? And then do they, are they the ones though, that say you have to have rules and regulations? Was it the government of te uh, Mexico or was it? It was us. We came up with it. We saw all of the rules and said, no, we need to work on it and make something for us that really works. Because we read all of the other rules and we're like, this doesn't make sense. Well, because they don't live here. 
Exactly. They haven't spent their time with the whales. So that's why we had to step in and right there. Well, we don't. There is a research team here that is from the University of La Paz and from Scripps University. They're collaborating together, working in the project that is called San Ignacio Lagoon Ecosystem. The, the way this program started was back in the end of the 90s when we had a threat from the Mitsubishi Corporation and ESA, which is salt works in Guerrero Negro. They were trying to develop here the biggest salt works in the world. Uh, salt works. Yes. So a lot of environmentalist groups from Mexico, from all over the world, and us here, we fought against it. And luckily, we made enough noise. I'm not saying that we knocked it down. We made enough noise for the Mexican president back in those days to hear about it and come see what was going on. So the Mexican president came here to the lagoon. I think it was like... Uh, it was 2000, no, it was 99, still 99. And he came here to the lagoon and he went out well watching well with Chavalo, one of the captains that is are with us right now. And he, him and his wife went out there, had friendly encounters, they had a really good time. He goes back to office on Monday and says, no salt works in Laguna San Ignacio. <laughs> and that got stated in the management plan that there will not be any more future attempts, which that makes me really happy. So. After, after this happened, well, Steve and Jorge, Jorge is the main Mexican scientist when it comes to whales, and he's the one that is from, from uh, University of La Paz and bring his teams from there. So Steve brings the team from Scripps, and together they were working in the environmental impact study back then. But when the Mexican president stepped in and just knocked it down like that, they were like, we didn't even finish our job. <laughs> So that's when they decided to start with this project that they're doing right now that is called San Ignacio Lagoon Ecosystem. And they still are collaborating with the two schools right there. Steve In, Schwartz has a book. Yes. Uh, Lagoon Time. And it tells some of this story from a different perspective. Yeah, of course. He's a North Americano, of course, and, but he, he mentions a lot of this in his book. Absolutely. Fight against the salt work. Yeah, I met Steve when I was one year old. So uh, like when he arrived, uh, he, he started talking to my dad a lot, and I remember him since day one. Like, I mean, my farthest memories, he's there. More questions? What can we as North Americanos do to support the ecosystem and to support the community? Two things. Give me two things that we, we as North Americanos can do to support the ecosystem and the community that surrounds it. Well... One thing which is very important and has become here in the lagoon, one of the main things for the local people is the whale watch. Keep on coming, keep on buying our trips. That's one. The other one, encourage everybody that comes to do it the right way. And when I'm saying the right way, do not put it in your head that the only reason that you're coming here is to touch a whale because it's not up to you, it's not up to us, it's up to them. So that's why it's very important that everybody understands how things really go here. Because a lot of the times we can get a boat full of people and telling the captain, I want to touch a whale, I want to touch a whale, I want to touch a whale. Well, let me tell you, if you put that much of pressure and that energy out there, it's not going to happen. I guarantee it. Why? Because whales can read you. Whales can sense. They can sense the, the, the vibe out there. If you are not open, I mean from your heart, to everything you, you have around you, you might not get this. Because I believe like magic happens when it's supposed to happen. And I've seen it. I'm going to give you this, this, this story that happened to me a bunch of years ago. We are there in two boats. I have Bobby, who is a guy like this big from Puerto Rico, and he sits in the center of the boat and he says, I don't need to touch a well. They're all my friends. They're all my family. I'm happy with you seeing them. And this guy was so funny, and we had the boat. Just everybody was so happy. And in the other boat, we had somebody who got pissed off from the moment he got on the boat because he, he wet his foot. So <laughs> then, same whale, 
same well. It's coming to our boats, we're touching it and stuff, then we pull away a little bit so the other boat can get in next to the well. The well goes under the boat, turns around, comes back to us and surface. Never surface to the other boat. And I was like, what's going on? When we went to the beach for a break, I talked to the guide in the other boat and she said, well, there's a guy there that's been pissed off the entire time. And, and that, I said, well, that's it. Energy does it. More questions? Okay, I'm going to tell you a story how I end up... Okay. I mean, besides asking for people to come again and that sort of thing, what do you see happening in your future with the whales and this... I have big questions in the air for that, actually. And uh, right now, I have the curiosity... And I know nobody in the, any of the companies is going to support this. But I have the curiosity to get everybody out of the water at least for a couple of days and see from shore what happens. I want to see the difference. I want to know how much, how much are we affecting by being there. Because I know that we have to be affecting somehow. Like, I'm going to put it this way. If I am used to be home on my own, enjoy everything that happens, maybe a couple of coyotes go by, and, but then I have 50 people walking in front of my house. I'm not going to be okay with that. And you guys can relate to this. And that's their house over there. And that's exactly what they're getting. 16 boats full of people every day from 8 to 5 p.m. right in their house. Taking pictures, being loud. So we don't know how they feel. And I, my curiosity is to see how they, they react by just having uh, a calm day out in the water with no noise. So, you know, it's sometimes there's a lot of, uh, of things that we could do, but are we going to do them? That's kind of the question, like how much pressure do we have from business to conservation? So I think we are kind of like this. Well, everybody has a different story. When the whales are gone, most of the captains and, uh, in the lagoon, they're fishermen. I haven't fished in a long time. In fact, I don't like fishing. I like fish. If somebody else catches for me, I'll eat it. But it's not what I enjoy. So I have ways different, different ways of life, so I don't need to fish. And, uh, well, it's just one less fisherman out there. Yes? So you were mentioning that you're going to decrease and we're trying to see what will happen if we, the people, are not out there looking at it. From what I understand, that it's about eight companies that are doing what you guys are doing. Yes. But is there a limit to that? Well, we are in the limit right now. Is, is 16 so boats. It's not going to be 12 companies doing the same nope. thing. No, nope. no. Eventually. It's the maximum that That's exactly why we have an association here. So we can be strong enough and protect the lagoon in that way. Because if we, are as individual companies, tell the Mexican government, don't give more permits, they're going to say, who the heck are you? We don't have power as individuals. So the association manages the eight companies that are doing this thing? We are all part of the association. Okay. So the, the companies, these eight companies are the association. There's like no one else. Okay. Yes? Does the association have any other financial support other than what you generate on your own? No. Nope. grants or anything? No. Nope. No, it's just us. Uh, we all pitch in by the end of the season like, okay, I had this many people in my company this year, well, okay, we're going to give this much to the association to, for management, for projects, for anything. And we all do it the same way. All right. Yes? Do whales get water in their lungs? It seems to me like water would go in. How do they resolve that? Well, they don't. They're very efficient because their lungs is the same, same as us. They're mammals. They cannot have water in their lungs, just like us. It doesn't go in. They are, it doesn't go in. They close fast enough. And when they blow from the bottom, they're creating air right there. So they're blowing, psh, closes. They're very efficient on that. If they got water in their lungs, it would be no good for them. Is there any scenario as the, as the oceans get warmer that the migration might go further down or bypass these lagoons? Uh, well, exactly. It could be farther north. Because if it, everything is warming up, 
it, that line of temperature that I was talking about is not going to make it as far down. And one of the problems, big problems that we're having with global warming right now is, is the scarceness of food. Why? Because this, the food the, that the whales are eating up north is these isopods. And they are, they're settled in the bottom of the ocean. And uh, they're settled in the bottom, but also this... These creatures down there, they're feeding from the same droppings of the algae that, 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 uh, that is under the ice. So the less ice there is, the less food is going to be. And uh, that's, if they transition into a different diet, then it, we would have big hopes of the population coming up again. Right. It's because it concentrates up the food chain, so it's it's a very concerning problem in, in the Arctic. Yeah, it, and and it's gonna go through all of the animals, like you know the the little ones that eat that and they all get eaten by the other one is gonna pass, and we're having a big problem with that. Yes. So you you talked um, very eloquently about how you learned from your dad. Who's learning from you? About us. I hope all of you. <laughs> but do you have younger generation, a younger generation learning from you? My kids. In, yeah. My kids, uh, my oldest kid, he wants to become a marine biologist. And uh, he comes well, well, both of my kids come well watching every single year. They have since day, day one. So they're interested in keeping on. Doing oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we're not just passing, in, passing the business onto the kids. We're passing the love for the whales. And I'm going to tell you guys the story on how I... I started as a whale watcher. So when I was 14, I decided to drop off school. And my dad didn't give me many options. He says, you either study or work. I say, I want to work. You guys are working with the whales. I want to do it too. So by then, my dad was the only local that had boat business here. My brother, Ranulfo, that some of you have met already, and my brother, Pancho, they were already captains with my dad. So when I drop off school, my dad said, okay, you got a job right now. And when we went over to the camp over in the point, so my job was I was a dishwasher at night for dinner. And then during the day, I would be in the boat with my dad out there well watching. He would give me the engine for short periods of time, like 10, 15 minutes, and then he would take it back. Eventually, one day he said, okay, you're ready, and you're going to go well watching tomorrow on your own. So you should have seen people's faces when they see a 14-year-old kid about to take him out while watching. Like, my dad's just holding the boat, and he's just wearing shoes, and they're like, Pachico, you're not going? He's like, oh, no, he's got it. And then Ranulfo and Pancho and me, we went out there, out there, the three of us, and luckily for me, very first outing, I got friendly whales. We had a great time, and that gave me a lot of confidence that I was doing things the right way. So following year, my dad gave me my own boat, and ever since. I've been working with the whales here in the lagoon, so I, I consider the whales part of my family as well. And there was times when my brother Pancho, who's the next one up from me, uh, I'm the youngest, he, he's the next one up, so we would run out of people to take out whale watching, and there would still be whales out there. Then we spent a lot of money that we made whale watching on going whale watching on our own. Oh, yeah. So it would be just the two of us going out there. One would drive the boat, and hold the camera, and the other one would be just touching whales and stuff. So we did a lot of tests, like whether, do they like like this, would they like it like this, or scratchy. We did so many tests out there, and we were just playing with the whales, and we loved it, they loved it. And um, those are some of the best memories I've had from my youth. I mean, we didn't have many toys, but our toys were big enough out there. <laughs> You know what? what like we figure that they all like something different. <laughs> <laughs> Just like us. That's why we started coming up with the, the fact that they all have different personalities. Yeah. I have one more question. Uh, you're doing great. Thank you so much for the lecture. It's amazing. Uh, I, was, I took a nice, uh, almost two-hour long walk along the beach today. I was not feeling well to go this morning. 
but I couldn't help to notice this padding that is along the beach in some sections. And I was wondering what that was. And I actually went and picked up a sample so I could bring it to you so you can maybe tell me what this is. Okay. It, it, uh, it looks like a type of grass, but I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. It's eelgrass. 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 And this is what the er turtles eat here in the lagoon. Ah. Um, and this washes off uh, to, onto shore. Sure. In periods of times when there's l so much of it and it packs up. Oh, I've seen it. There's oh, yeah. like this, and there was layers like this out there. So oh, there is times, there, or there has been times here in the lagoon where we used to cut them on the beach. Okay, one minute. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we cut them in the beach, and we used to have like a, a stick, and we just go out like a, like a, like a raft, exactly. We used to go out to the channel and just jump off and go for a swim when we were kids. There would be like 10, 15 kids on it. All my cousins. Wow. Yeah, I think it was a type of grass. I didn't know, so that's yeah. why I wanted to ask it. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.